talking about really a lot of projects and I'm gonna go fast and I'm gonna show you glimpses and tell you stories. And I think maybe the most important thing is to be generous. That is about sharing is everything. And that all started actually with the first project we did that was an open national competition in 1989, where Snöta was really, really right out of school, young people, and we won the big international anonymous competition for the library in Alexandria. That was really the kickoff. And we wanted to work internationally from day one. So for this library, it's at least for a time, was the seventh largest library in the world with this amazing history. How would we actually work with the concept? So if you think of your by the Mediterranean uh, Sea, and it's all about human scale. So if you are by the sea, it's totally flat. And you, we have been working with a circle, a circular shape to gain, uh, to uh, include everybody. And if you think of a, a disc that you have at the same height as your eye height, which is the same as the horizon, and you tilt it, you get one point. And this point we said was today, present. Because the long history of the library, we needed to talk about the past. So when we took away everything that was below actually sea level, we got the past and it stretches out into future. And this diagram show with one single line that actually was the intention of the project. Coming from the past, it's all about, and specifically I would say culture, it's the present and it goes into the future. So this was actually how we worked with the project and that is actually landing in the water. And if you see to the right of the picture, you see this little, uh, the little bridge that actually stretches over to uh, the, the University of Alexandria. That was also part of how we work with it. We, uh, in Egypt, there is still so many people that can't read and write. So there was a big controversy to spend so much money on the library that not so many could use because there are not so many that can, uh, that can read. But we said it's even more important to have a library in, uh, here and that it had an easy connection and that it was an open space. And when it got in, uh, inside, it should be an open atmosphere. So the big reading room actually consists of seven different layers. It's wrapped around with uh, letters or signs from all the different languages around the world. We worked with, uh, an, uh, we worked with artists and historians, and that actually was an open space around it. They wanted to have it fenced so actually not everybody should get in. We said it, the most important is that it's open for everybody. After the, the opening and after it had been used for many years, of course, when we had the Arabic Spring, it was really a tough period. And it was extremely touching for us when we got updates from Alexandria that they actually show that the students were standing hand in hand and actually were protecting the library so nobody should uh, destroy it. And that is all about ownership. And when a project has ownership, when actually the user are taking care of it, that's the most important thing for us, for we can be there to design and have ideas and be there through the whole uh, building period, but it needs to have ownership of its own. And you can see in the skyline, which is maybe more like a landscraper than a skyscraper. It's a, also a new agenda in Alexandria. So this was open 2000, 2001. And about this cityscape and landscape, there was another uh, open anonymous competition and that was in Oslo in 2000. And that was about the Norwegian opera and ballet. Uh, and as you see here from um, the image from 2000, uh, how Oslo was meeting the ocean, as so many cities around the world, extremely terrible because it was just a road and not that you could reach uh, the water and too much infrastructure in the way. The good thing about um, the brief for the competition was that they actually said that the cultural building should be the first in a big transformation of the whole area. It meant that it could set the standard for the rest of actually the, the building projects. And the fantastic thing was that we actually won the competition and it's very close to uh, uh, where we have that, our office. So it was easy to us from to follow from A to Z. 
the project itself, what was uh, in the concept. Uh, Oslo is a very green city, and as you see, it was very close to, uh, to the ocean, but it didn't really connect to it. So we said both to connect to the ocean and maybe even more important to connect the city grid to the green frame around. And we have a hill, the Ekeberg hill, that we wanted to reconnect to and that the opera should be lower. It was only the stage towers that could be higher. And the threshold should be zero. So we wanted people to have accessibility and it should be easy to get into it. Because it was a big fight in Norway by the politicians that say that why on earth should we spend so much money for an opera that no, nobody is interested in. So it was fantastic that they actually, the site that was chosen made a whole transformation of the rest of the area. Also for the concept, we worked with this curved wall that actually is between land and ocean, which is then between the city and the theater world. And then on the back, we made a factory where it's like four or 500 people uh, working there. So they needed to have practical and technical and really good facilities. And on top of that, we wrapped it with a carpet to make it as one object. And this object, was the new white object, uh, the landscape, the opera and the ballet, this building, this new cultural gem that was supposed to now be the new thing in, in Oslo. Uh, the site was pretty uh, complicated because it's uh, most of it's below a sea level. So of course, a watertight building. There was a, uh, a lot about talk of how much maybe Viking ships will find underneath there, but actually everything was on time and even built six months uh, faster than the, the project was supposed to be. Here you still see the heavy road to, and it was really hard to cross over to the opera. The notion of this white building that we have from the start in the competition was important for us. The not so good thing about the, um, uh, the competition brief was, was that they didn't have anything with a public plaza. They said this will just stop by the facade and we know that no, no building at all just stopped by the facade. But then the good thing about that was that if they don't have a brief, they don't really have a program to say everything you have to do in the public space. So then we could more or less talk about this as a landscape because we have this um, uh, the sloping surface that is also more or less like a landscape because you don't have a program in the nature in landscape. So all these planes that we work with, that of course was this carpet according to the whole thing. For us, we said since so many people are not say that they're not will be interested uh, in the opera, you should be able to go on top of the opera and hopefully get people inside of the opera. So the notion of a public space that is 24 seven open, like a landscape was important. And you know, Norwegian, we love to go hiking, to go on a tour. We work with three artists. There was an architect and a landscape architect that actually work with the actual carpet and it's 33,000 individual stones. And it is all a cladding uh, that also the very discussion where the stone could come from. Uh, we ended up with the Carrara marble from Italy because it was really hard to get a quarry to actually have all the same um, uh, the same parameters from that could cover the 19,000 square meters. But all these slopes was, of course, a discussion. Will it be accessible for everybody? Since the slopes are, some of them are pretty uh, tough. It uh, didn't, uh, and, but it was really gentle slope to get into the, to the front door. So this is a drawing that shows the different uh, slopes and then the discussion about uh, universal accessibility. So we marked the, uh, the kinks, the small steps, and the slopes that were too uh, sort of uh, that it was uh, not so gentle. So all the kings were isolated and we marked them as art. So in one stone, as you see here, there is a step. So this step stone is art and the one on the other side is public plaza because you don't mark 
art with a contrast color and we actually managed to come get away with that so it's all a white carpet the threshold was very important for us and that people could see what was going on inside and people started to get very curious and a lot of people had gotten into the opera it's also a a very open space and there is outdoor concerts and some of them are free and the most crazy one was when Justin Bieber were there with 10,000 screaming teenager girls and 50 men obviously you can see that it's not from this concert and of course we have winter situation uh, and you have then for the uh, uh, to get into the door, it's always um, uh, it's warm and it's easy. But if you go on the steeper slope, you have to go there uh, on your own risk. And the most important is there are so many fantastic operas and ballets in indoor. And I hope you will come and visit Oslo and and go and visit the project and uh, the magical world. Human public spaces, that is also part of how we can contribute to a new agenda and to, to be open for that. A project that we have been working on in New York City is Times Square, the most, the busiest and I would say crammed and not so nice place to be. And I would say the New Yorkers have been hating the area for many, many years because there was too much traffic and too much uh, tourists. So for 20 years, they were discussing how they can redo, uh, if it was possible, to make uh, a jam traffic uh, a street to become actually a pedestrian area. So the New Yorker also had two front pages, what this could be. What does it mean to make a pedestrian area? We, our project was from uh, 42nd to 47th Street and um, Broadway, that is the big diagonal going through Manhattan, uh, crosses everything and the 90 degrees grid. So the uh, so um, Broadway was supposed to be a uh, pedestrian area and 7th Avenue would, would have one-way traffic going south. And there was a lot of statistic that was be done that was done before. It was a testing period for two years, testing out for the traffic. And then we were the lucky winners to work with the project for the new layers on top. And what do you do? The least space we had was 75 millimeters to work on because of all the infrastructure and the complication. We couldn't do anything with... Uh, uh, all the commercials, uh, all, all the facades. So we worked with these two lines in the grid of the cityscape. And we even marked them with small coins as they could do some bling bling from the, all the colored light. So the two direction for orientation was uh, our concept. I would, I would say that most people that are walking on Times Square today, they have no idea that it has been redone and there is a new carpet uh, with custom-made um, uh, pavers, but they can walk and they can actually behave in a different way that they used to. And the transition to be a full uh, equipped carpet that could do anything, like the Yoga Day or the Rodeo Day, or for me, much more important that it could also be uh, worked as a, a place where you can raise your voice and that you don't really think that it's a public, it absolutely is a public place. It's not so much about the traffic. Since the opening of the pedestrian plaza, that was already in 2009, there had been uh, uh, the, the, the pedestrian injuries fell by 40% in the area despite of 59% increase in pedestrian foot traffic. And then in 2008, 80% of visitors feel that Snurta's pedestrian plaza make Times Square a safer, nicer, and more New York place to be. This is really important for the behavior and also the quality of the space, and they keep on doing a lot of statistic. So from the building period, it lasted more years. It was uh, a tough for all the uh, commercial activities, and of course, the theaters around. But then, uh, this notion of that you can sit down and you have this 
big secondary seating elements and also there have been more seating that people could slow down instead of just stress so also that people can come together and also uh, and occupy the space it's has been very important and this is also a lot about ownership another thing that is crucial is to talk about the environment we use uh, words as sustainability and, and environmental as words but what does it actually mean we started working with this when we got into a research group uh, where we could follow the project with a lot of different professions so we work with um, um, together with something called powerhouse and zebs because of according according to world resources the energy sector and building industry it accounts for over 40 percent of global industries heat trapping emission combined which means that we need to work with the whole process from a to c in uh, when we're doing new projects and there are exca uh, excavation and to the end results so zep and poros is an interdisciplinary research design engineering and industry collaboration in norway and there are some examples i'm going to show you the powerhouse uh, is during its life cycle that we then said is 60 years needs to produce more renewable energy than it consumes for production of building materials construction operation and demolition of the building uh, and the building needs to be built in those uh, uh, conditions. And uh, the ZEB is the zero emission buildings and the ZEN is the uh, zero emission neighborhoods in smart cities. So we started up with a small uh, single family house, which we called a multi-comfort house. It's actually a demonstration platform more than it's um, a single family house to have a learning platform for building mythology and it is a plus house and it has all these different uh, sustainability solutions more important for the builders and all the different uh, uh, people they're going to work like the plumbers and the electricians and the, uh, the the timber work and the concrete work was more important so it's also a demonstration so this building had a lot more of um, uh, different solutions that it would have in a single family house and also to talk about what is comfort what is comfortable to be indoor and outdoor throughout the year so for this project we will of course work with thermal mass and all the materials should be uh, uh, more or less local and the, uh, the woodwork and how it don't do any excavation to try to also reduce mass balance, the indoor and outdoor situation. And of course we need a fireplace. We need a lot of wood to have a nice fire, indoor and outdoor, and the comfort, how we um, use the space indoor and light condition was very important. Another project that was sort of the second that was built is the, uh, it's reinvention of existing buildings. We have to reuse what already is built. We can't just demolish. I think it's fine because it was bad built. This building is from the 1980s. It's so 1980s that the city municipality said that it has um, it has to remain with the facade. The facade is both leaking and the insulation was terrible but the black facade was important to be kept. Uh, this was before we started to do something, I would say a pretty common situation for an office building, very boring as all the cubicles and not really, and bad air, not so good uh, uh, window solutions. So we had to redo all of that, but keep it as uh, the, the frame and the envelope. So with um, specifically, Working a lot with uh, both the insulation and ventilation was maybe the biggest and toughest driver. How to make also the comfortable with uh, noise, so exposed ceiling. Uh, all the new materials for the baffles here are reused plastic bottles. And then how to make the ventilation new openings, so the vertical, I mean the stairs going up, 
uh, made the air go very slow, so it's all naturally ventilated. So this became the new feature of the building and was solving most of our challenges. And then here also it has a lot of local energy. It has for the ventilation, it's super important to figure out how this new uh, wavy uh, wall could work. And the zoning of the energy was really important and the acoustics. For the outdoor situation that used to be uh, glass panels that was reused in the interior, we had the new uh, wooden planks and used a traditionally Japanese way to burn the surface in the surface and oil it and then remain with the same kind of uh, notion of a black, black building. The third project in this powerhouse is uh, 63 degrees north in Trondheim. It's a new office building. Uh, it's 18,000 and the energy production is 500,000 kilowatt per year. This uh, project uh, just newly opened and has a lot of solar panels. And then when we said a uh, form follows environment, it was a lot about harvesting. And the angle, uh, the roof angle was to try to harvest as much as possible which is a little bit um, hard when you are so far up north, but we worked with this angle and the, the atrium to get a better microclimate and of course also make better uh, situation for a light condition because it's a pretty uh, wide um, uh, the, the site. And again, here we had the uh, exposed ceilings and the Ventilation for the vertical axis was important. And then since we had we couldn't have the angle as steep as we wanted because then the building got far too high compared to the, the neighboring buildings and the city municipality didn't want that. It's still much higher, but then it actually also shows that it, it is different. So it shows that it will harvest and it's part of the new cityscape and the skyline of Trondheim. I think also we need to rethink circularity, uh, which we have been working in a project with, um, uh, with re research and in, uh, innovation. And we went into plastic. Uh, this is important because it's a lot about waste. Today, 2.4% of what Norway produces become part of cir circular economy. 2.4%, that's nothing, which means that 97.6% remains as waste. It's according to, uh, uh, you can download uh, the Circular Norway report, and the world economy is 8.6, so they're better than Norway, but still really, really bad. EU and Norway will go from linear to circular economy. It's all about reducing waste. We have everything we buy easily becomes waste. We have to rethink how to work with it. The plastic generation and the plastic recovery to reuse the plastic is super bad. And we have to rethink and we have to set a new agenda. All this waste, and to understand the notion of that, we went into that in a research project and figure out how there are so many types of plastic. We have to understand how it can be reused and uh, what can we do in it and what can be reused in a new way. So we were testing a lot and made all these samples and it actually ended up in a small uh, exhibition. Uh, we rented a container and made this plastic uh, container outside our building. And uh, we had a little poster uh, <laughs> outside that said, if you're interested in any type of this uh, exhibition of plastic, please contact us. And NCP did that. Nordic Comfort Products, uh, they are producing uh, things in plastic, specifically furniture. There are a tiny um, uh, factory in Northern Norway, they have 21 employees, but the furniture manufacturing is 75,000 units per year. They are working on plastic today, but they didn't really have any thoughts about uh, specifically reusing. So we were trying to look into a product they already had, the R48 chair, and we figure out together, we, of course, 
with them that it produces 11 kilo CO2 per chair, cradle to gray. How can you make this product better and re to use reuse materials and how to, of course, reduce the CO2 footprint? We also figure out that if you could use local plastic and have the, uh, the circularity better, we could also work with a uh, fish industry, which is right outside in the ocean. The container surface was there to actually demolish and, and uh, make the plastic into small pieces, then work with NCP and Snota. So four together to work with this. So the fish industry is huge in Norway and a lot of the nets, they are only waste. To reuse these uh, uh, nets, to make plastic and to do that straight into the uh, new production. So the new S118 chair has gonna go a little smaller, lighter, better comfort, it's staggable. It should not use uh, anything else that no reusable plastic and is now between five to eight kilo CO2 cradle to cradle. So a full production only recycle a plastic will be uh, during this year. And if there's license to other places to actually uh, do the production, it has to be local plastic. So we reduce the transportation. So this new uh, chair, that is an old chair, that's a revamp of, um, uh, of an old um, design, is now uh, trans uh, transported hopefully mostly local, but it's used also a lot for kids uh, in schools and it makes a difference. I had to go super speedy fast because I know the time is limited, but I read, really also like to talk about that site matters. And I think in the Nordic countries, we're more into that. This project is a tiny project, not in very Northern Sweden. It's a seventh room together with um, a tree hotel. It's in the forest. It's all about Kent and Britta that has this um, bed and breakfast and wanted to make tree hotels. I mean, tree huts, that's something we dream about when we're kids and we keep on dreaming of when we are big kids. Uh, in northern Sweden with plus 30 in the summer and minus 40 in the winter. And they're really proud of the northern light and they're very proud of the forest. The tourist industry of we know that it's been a big change with COVID-19. We know also that we locally, Norwegian go to Norway, Finns go to Finland, Swedes go to Sweden. So it's also reintroduction of our own country as a tourist destination. The existing tree rooms, great personality. So we figure out that this sibling needed to just be a small building, but it should be situated differently. So the small cabin as the Nordic cabins that we love to have, our second homes, it needed to be elevated in the forest to make as little footprint as possible and that the trees should be the major part. It would, we wouldn't to, to be executed locally, local wood, local workers, and really work it as this one situation. So it was lifted up by two big cranes which also meant that we got a sixth surface. Uh, in the Op Oslo Opera, we have the fifth uh, facade, which was the roof. Now we have the sixth surface that is underneath the building. So we had a photographer to make an image of the forest before we built it. And it was then um, uh, on a two millimeter aluminum sheet uh, print that when you go underneath the building, it actually disappears. And then it's uh, this Nordic, uh, very light, open feeling. You're inside the tree crowns and you have a fireplace and you can sit and watch the, the, the midnight sun. And in the summer, it's all light. Uh, the, the Nordic, the Aurora is beautiful, but it's still about the forest and to keep the forest and the people are visiting the forest. Uh, since being up in the air, we also need to go under. This is a project in southern, southern uh, west coast of Norway. 
Uh, it's an existing hotel and two brothers own that hotel and they had this crazy idea that they wanted to make an underwater restaurant. Uh, together with um, uh, a maritime um, researcher, which looks into how uh, all kinds of uh, maritime life below sea level uh, lives and how they react to light and how they react to reconstruction of underwater landscape in a way to watch that it has been hard because usually there are divers, but to have a space that you can do it more or less constantly. So we find the best spot uh, after a while, convinced the, the client that uh, it has to be a little bit uh, outside uh, the key area. And it's a 34 meter long and 12 meter uh, wide building, five meters below sea level. You go in on a bridge. This was the, uh, the image, the rendering that was made and this is how it looks when it was finished. One notion about that is also that social media is totally crazy. When we have our image, uh, we had 700 million hits in a week, which is not understandable, but people were so curious to see this, uh, this project. This was the rendering again. This is the reel when it was built. It was executed on site and towed over uh, to the other, I mean, 100 meter over the key area. And also the kids, uh, the local people could watch how it actually was situated and uh, found uh, the foundation on site. The testing of the 11 meter wide and 30 centimeter uh, um, acrylic glass uh, for the building process and when it was open, even the furniture we uh, managed, we have designed and it's made locally of local oak. It's really all about people. And I think Snurta's contribution to the new agenda is to keep on doing good concepts. And we have to rethink what we're building. We have to rethink how we think of waste and cut the waste. And we have to always be challenging by new project. We are a fantastic gang and we like to go hiking uh, to Snoeta. This is in the wide range center, but I think, and the transdisciplinary actions and to work together to push the world with architecture and think outside the bo box will be our challenge for the, for the new agenda. So thanks a lot for your attention.